Previously on the channel, we discussed the first film in Wes Craven's slasher film series, Scream. But that was Wes Craven's second slasher film series. Today, we're going to be talking about his first with Nightmare on Elm Street. A Nightmare on Elm Street tells the tale of teenager Nancy Thompson and her friends who are apparently being picked off by some sort of dream monster. This dream monster is some sort of burned man with a finger knife glove by the name of Freddy Krueger. Released in 1984, this is of course one of the most well-known slasher films of all time. And like most successful franchises, this did something a little bit different. Instead of being a typical slasher, this movie screwed with reality itself, often jumping between the dream world and the real world. It also often left up to question what exactly was real and what wasn't. And like most slasher films pre-Scream, this had a very new cast, but there were some notable names in this. And believe it or not, this movie marks the first ever film role of Johnny Depp. Yeah, that's right. Kevin Bacon started in Friday the 13th. Well, Johnny Depp started in Nightmare on Elm Street. Now, while this is a unique and very well-written slasher film, the ending to this movie is sort of super confusing. We're going to go over that in a little bit, but first we need to see what actually happened in the movie. So we're going to do that right now as we take a look back at A Nightmare on Elm Street, 1984. So the movie begins with teenager Tina Gray running through some sort of boiler room. She's being stalked by some creepy burned looking man with a finger knife glove who eventually jumps out at her. This causes her to wake up revealing it was all a dream, or was it, as there's a giant slash through her nightgown. The next day Tina confides these dreams in her best friend Nancy as well as her boyfriend Glenn and they agree to sleep over at her house that night. During the sleepover they all find out that they're all having similar dreams about the same person. They're interrupted however by Tina's boyfriend Rod who sleeps with Tina in the master bedroom while Glenn and Nancy sleep in different areas of the house. During the night however Tina wakes up to find out that someone has broken her window with a rock. Nancy, who's sleeping in the other room, just misses something coming out at her for the wall also. Tina meanwhile heads outside and comes face to face with a mysterious man who just wants a hug. And by a hug, I mean a good old stabbing party. And Tina gets stabbed repeatedly and dragged all throughout her bedroom while her boyfriend Rod watches in horror as the figure is invisible to him. Nancy and Glenn break into the room to find Tina dead on the floor covered in blood and Rod is missing. The next day, Tina insists on going to school, where she's pulled aside by Rod, who's on the run from the police. He's captured, however, by Nancy's dad, Don, who's a police lieutenant. So later that day, Nancy is in class and is trying her best not to fall asleep during the lecture. But looking out into the hallway, she sees Tina's bloody body in a bag, speaking out to her. She follows the trail of blood all the way down to the school boiler room, you know, like all schools have. There she comes face to face with the mysterious man who begins to chase her throughout the boiler room. As the figure finally corners her, however, Nancy burns her arm on a steam pipe in the boiler room. This causes her to wake up, thrashing about and screaming, scaring the crap out of all the other students as well as her teacher. The teacher sends her home, but once she's outside, she notices that the burn mark on her arm from the boiler room is still there. Nancy then goes to visit Rod in jail and he describes how Tina was killed and also reveals that he too has been having these nightmares. Nancy then begins to believe that this mysterious burn victim is actually the one who killed Tina and not Rod. That night Nancy is having a bath but she falls asleep and the figure pulls her under the water almost drowning her before her mom bursts in and saves her. Nancy then finds some caffeine pills, which she begins taking in an effort to stay awake. Glenn then comes to visit her, and Nancy instructs him to watch over her while she sleeps. So during her dream, she ends up at the police station again, where she sees Freddy and Rod cell about to murder him. Freddy then turns his attention to her, however, and she calls out to Glenn to wake her up, but unfortunately, he too has fallen asleep. Just as the figure's about to kill her, however, she wakes up when the alarm goes off, and she berates Glenn for falling asleep. Glenn and Nancy then go down to the police station and demand to see Rod, but they're a little bit late, as the figure has used Rod's own bedsheets to hang him. After Rod's funeral, Nancy describes to her parents the man she keeps seeing in her dreams, and her mother Marge decides to take her to a sleep institute. As they monitor her sleep, she has another nightmare and wakes up with blood all over her arm. However, it appears she's also been able to pull a mysterious hat out of the dream. The hat also had a name on it, 
Fred Krueger. The next morning in the kitchen, she confronts her mother on the identity of Krueger, but she pretends to feign ignorance. Nancy and Glenn then have a lunch date where Glenn tells her about the Balinese way of dreaming. Apparently the Balinese got all their literature and ideas from dreams, but if they thought of a monster, they basically had to turn their back on it and claim they didn't fear it, or else they'd be killed. Nancy then returns home to find that her mother has put bars on all the windows. She confronts her mother about this, who finally agrees to tell her the real tale of Freddy Krueger. So apparently Freddy Krueger was a child murderer who killed about 25 children in the area a long time ago. After Krueger was acquitted, Marge and a bunch of the other parents burned him alive inside his boiler room where he used to torture kids. She then reaffirms to Nancy that Freddy Krueger is dead and can't hurt her. But my problem with this is if she's not afraid of Kruger and she really thinks Kruger is dead, why did she put bars on all the windows? Nancy, meanwhile, who has not slept in seven days, has formulated a plan. She calls Glenn on the phone and tells him to be at her house around midnight, where she's going to go to sleep and pull Kruger out of her dream, at which time Glenn will knock him out. Just one problem though is Glenn's parents have blocked him from going outside, but it doesn't really matter anyway, because he fell asleep. This doesn't work out very well for him as he's sucked into his bed, after which he basically explodes. Nancy's dad and the rest of the police force arrive at the scene, at which point Nancy calls him and tells him to break into the house exactly 20 minutes from then. Nancy then proceeds to possibly inspire Home Alone, which came out six years after, as she sets booby traps all throughout her house. After putting her drunk mother to sleep in her bed, she goes to sleep herself and begins her search for Kruger. She locates Kruger, at which point she tackles him and is able to successfully pull him into the real world. She locks Kruger in her room and alerts the police to what's going on, and after Freddy gets free, she leads him downstairs to the other booby traps. They eventually end up in the basement, at which point Nancy lights his ass on fire. The police break into the house and make their way into the basement, but it appears that Kruger is no longer there. Nancy and her dad follow the trail of fire upstairs, at which point they find a burning Kruger on top of her mother. Kruger and Marge then seemingly merge into one another, and then dissipate into the bed. John leaves the room with the other police officers, and Kruger once again appears for the bed, but it doesn't appear that Nancy is afraid this time. Nancy tells Freddy that she's no longer afraid of him, and that she's stripping him of all his power, and that she wants her family and all her friends back. Kruger then tries to lunge at her, but he evaporates as soon as he does. Upon opening the door, it appears everything's hunky-dory. Her mother's alive, and look at that, all her friends are alive too. But then the convertible they're in locks itself and begins to drive itself away as you see some kids skipping rope and singing Freddy's theme song. And sure enough, Freddy bursts through the door and drags Marge through to end the film. Alright, so let's talk about this ending for a second, because if you're confused, I don't blame you. It's a little bit strange. So it's worth noting that while Nancy is telling off Kruger, she lets him know that she's aware that everything going on in that moment isn't real, and apparently when Freddy was pulled into the real world, that didn't actually happen, and everything with the police didn't actually happen. They were still in the dream world the entire time. Now, that part makes sense, but what happens after is what I'm struggling with a bit. Because she seemingly defeats Kruger, but she's still in the dream world, but she's not the one that's killed, Marge is the one that is killed. So maybe it's Marge's dream, but how is she still in the dream world? Maybe that's it, maybe they're in Marge's dream this time and she's being killed, but Nancy defeated him. It's, it's really confusing. It's also worth noting, this is spoilers, but Nancy comes back in the third Nightmare on Elm Street film, so she didn't die. So my conclusion is that maybe it was Marge's dream that they cut to, and that's why she was killed, but Nancy wasn't because he defeat she defeated him. I don't know. This is a great film, but the ending requires a lot of thinking about. Despite that confusing ending, this is a great film, and one of the most important slasher films of all time. It is worth noting though that this movie came out in what is considered the last year of the slasher golden age, which is interesting, considering the slasher golden age ended with Wes Craven, and then the film genre was saved by another film series by Wes Craven. Speaking of Wes Craven, he is not involved with the follow-up to this movie, 
It's Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, which we will be taking a look back when we return to the series. And as a result of that, it's not as good, but we'll judge it for ourselves when we see it. Craven does come back, though, for a Nightmare on Elm Street 3 Dream Warriors, which again, is where Nancy will make her return. And due to the schedule for this month being revised, the next review is actually coming very soon on Tuesday when we come back with Eyes Without a Face. But in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the more unique and one of the greatest horror films of all time. And most of this film, aside from the very, very end when Marge's body being dragged for the window is very obviously a dummy, that, that's a little... It's a little obvious. Aside from that, the effects in this movie and the plot itself and the horror aspect, everything about this movie, aside from the dummy, holds up incredibly well. And yes, the ending is super confusing, but I don't think that should take away from how good of a film this really was. And if you have a different interpretation of the ending than I did, then feel free to tell me in the comments down below. I'd love to hear how you guys think this ending actually went. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is going to do it for my review of A Nightmare on Elm Street 1984. We have a lot of nightmare to cover in the future, as this film, of course, like most slasher films, spawned a giant franchise, which spawned one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sequels, as well as a remake in 2010. We will get to all that eventually, but that is going to do it for me today. Uh, if you guys liked the video, be sure to like it. If you didn't like it, don't. Uh, if you want to check out any of my social media links, they're all in the description down below. Thank you to all 59 of my patrons named in the description for helping support me and the channel. Uh, with all that being said, though, my name is Tafford's team. This has been my Elm Street look back at A Nightmare on Elm Street 1984, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.